but I want to turn the program over to get started with a bad man to my right. No, well, there's a lot of bad man to my right. Um, a leader in our, in our General Assembly who speaks for real people, who sees real people where they are. Um, there are a lot of folks in the General Assembly who really don't care about their communities. This is not one. Um, this is somebody who you can trust to go there and advocate for you and those who you love. Ladies and gentlemen, Delegate Harris. Great afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Let's try that again. Pretend we're in church. Great afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Now, now I need to um, get, get um, David's uh, cash app so I can pay him some extra uh, funds. But we're excited to be here for uh, Angela today. We're excited that Angela came all the way down here to share with us um, what's on her mind and the reason why she is running for a U.S. Senate. And I'm supporting her because at the end of the day, Leadership matters. Let me say that again. Leadership matters through good times and especially through bad times. And that we have that perfect example in the county executive that's running for the U.S. Senate, Angela Olson. So once you leave here, make sure you leave here with that thought in mind and then share that same thought with five other people and tell them to share with five other people because we need every single person out here to help us help Angela get to the U.S. Senate because we need her there. Yeah. Right? Woo! So it's my privilege this time to introduce uh, the man to my right. Uh, I have known him for uh, a couple of years. Uh, we used to talk on the phone a lot early, early in the mornings. Um, and so he's been a great mentor to me. We're excited that he's here. Our uh, senator for the 27th district. Uh, the Senator Michael A. Jackson. Thank you, Delegate Harris. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are happy to be here. This is uh, the second leg of the tour today for me. Uh, the District 27, uh, District 28, uh, 27A, in particular, that uh, Delegate Harris and I share is part of Prince George's County and Charles County. Uh, District 27 is broken up into three subdistricts. Uh, we have 27B, which is Prince George's and Calvert County, which we share today, and then this is 27C, which is solely in Calvert County. Uh, we need your support in the southern part uh, of our state, and we need to make sure that you, each and every one of you, and us, are true surrogates for uh, Angela Olson. I've had the extreme pleasure of knowing her well over 20 years, working together up in Prince George's County. I've seen her leadership uh, when she was running the the section within the state's attorney's office dealing with domestic violence, which was one of my sticks when I was a sheriff up there uh, in the county as well. We're running uh, the Revenue Authority, which was about economic development, and she has continued that as county executive, a dynamic team led by Ms. Led by Ms. Angie Rogers uh, on economic development in, in the region, uh, and then as a terrific county executive that helped us weather the storm of COVID, something we never, ever thought we'd see in our, in our lifetime. Uh, but she weathered that uh, and became a statewide leader, by the way, uh, serving in the General Assembly. Uh, when we had the local county executives and the mayor of Baltimore County Chief, uh, Annapolis, uh, Angela also was the leader of those uh, counties that we went forward. Uh, and lastly, uh, you know, uh, Congressman Hoyer said this earlier today, uh, his uh, support is not objective. Uh, his opinion is not objective. Mine is certainly not as well. Uh, I want to uh, shout out in this uh, uh, environment Kevin and I represent 18% of Charles County uh, but we are always 100% visible in Charles County because we're going to need every one of us to give a 100% effort uh, to get him and also go to city on the next United States Senator uh, we're in uh, and I'm glad to be here today and uh, I'm going to pass the mic over to uh, a, a colleague of mine from the Charles County Commissioners, uh, Commissioner Amanda Stewart. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it is truly an honor to be here today to speak, um, just to share a little bit about why I believe in County Exec Angela Alsabrooks for the U.S. Senate. It is really important, I've, said, I've shared this before, it's really important to have people in office that she has 
one of the things that I know for certain is, is that when she is working for us, she will be able to focus on economic development, um, the health of the country, but also education. And we cannot forget that as we go out in the community and talking with our, our friends, our neighbors, our family, let's remember education. The other side is gonna be pushing back and we need to strongly speak for our next U.S. Senator, Ms. Angela Alsabrooks, about her proven track record when it comes to education. If it's about what's in the classroom or even the infrastructure of the entire building, it is clear that she knows what's best for education from the top of the building to everything within the building. So I appreciate your leadership and I, I admire you for what you have done for the state of Maryland. And I look forward to being able to just go out in the public and talk and share your information and share what you have done as a leader and what we can expect as Marylanders for the years and years to come. So thank you so much for being here today in Charles County. Thank you. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Ralph Patterson, Commissioner Ralph Patterson. Thank you very much, Commissioner Stewart. And thank you all for coming out here. You could have been anywhere and you chose to come out today. But just like my colleague was saying, I'm Commissioner Vice President Patterson. And I just want to say thank you very much for uh, Senator Ross for, for coming down here because you, there are a lot bigger counties in our state, and you chose to come down here because you realize how important our county is to your, your campaign. And we want to reciprocate that by showing you that we got your back 100%. And so I'll say this. I work in Prince George's County, and I it, I had to take a while to, to learn about you, and I had to see for my own self. And what I've seen over the four years that I've been working in Prince George's County has been remarkable. And just seeing you across the state, you know, BACOs and media conferences, it shows that you not only care about the majority, but you care about the entire system. And that's what we're going to need in this time. So I'm just beyond thrilled to be able to be here side by side with you to help you get to where you need to go so that you can work all of that. Thank you so much for being here. So I think everyone knows that our mission is very simple. And that is, in fact, to elect Angelo Alsbrook as the next United States Senator representing the state of Maryland. That's the bottom line. In order to accomplish that, it requires developing a groundswell of support, beginning with organizing in every single community here in Charles County. That's the goal. We want to make sure that Charles County supports you. I support Angela Austin Brooks because she's a visionary. From the very beginning, sharing uh, our experiences as leaders here in this region, her understanding of regionalism more than anything else has shined for me. I recall both of us. Um, were interviewed by News 4 when it was announced that Charles County surpassed Prince George's County as being the wealthiest majority African-American population in the entire nation. Now, she didn't hate on it. She didn't hate on it at all. You know what she said? In fact, she said it was a good thing. It was enlightening as it relates to this region. You have this region of relative wealth that exists and we've worked on uh, transportation issues together, and we've seen the fruits of that labor providing opportunities for all of our citizens. So I'm here because I totally support Angela Alsabrooks. She is a visionary leader. She is someone that will move the state of Maryland forward. And so with that, I'd like to introduce the good chef, Chef Kendra uh, Selby, who will He's going to okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted Kendall to come up because first and foremost, right, yeah. all of us that reside in Charles County appreciate this man yeah. and <laughs> the work that he's doing providing fine cuisine here in the Southern Maryland region. So 
please so it's a big job <laughs> I just first want to say thank you I'm thankful to God that everyone is here from Prince George's County as well as Charleston. We don't take it lightly, but I wanted to say something really quick. How I feel about voting is this is this important, and how I do things is I put empathy like this. If I believe in what you're saying and you're true to the people. I put this in every bag of food that goes out the doors. So it's a message to delivering to the people. And I'm super, super duper proud of you, sister. My wife saw me. I'm, I'm so excited about putting these in every bag of food that come out of Selby's and I challenge any other business owner that are here, that if you are selling something, you need to be doing the same things if your hips are in this place. Put these in every bag so that the people that are not present can get the message of who they should be voting for. Our, our person right here, Angela also. I hope that you all have enjoyed so far what uh, Chef Kendall and Sor Karen and I have prepared for you. I see y'all eating these wings and everything and all the salads we had to cut up, so I hope you all have enjoyed it. Um, but I have to say to, um, to Chef and to Sor Karen, first of all, thank you so much for welcoming us into your beautiful, beautiful new restaurant. And congratulations. Oh, It is not easy to do, and, uh, and so we are so especially proud. We will be back um, to support you and just really are just so grateful. Um, I want to say also to my friends in elective service who did not have to. I am so grateful to each of them. They did not have to um, come into this race, and they came early, early. These were among the first supporters that I got in this race. Um, started delegate. I want to thank you so much, Delegate Harris, for your leadership and for, uh, for your support. We're excited about all that we're going to accomplish. We have a new legislative session that's going to be starting soon, and we we go there with the intention of bringing back the bacon. So we're excited uh, about what is to come. To Commissioner Stewart, thank you so much also uh, for your early support. She has been right there with me since, since the very beginning. Want to thank you also. Uh, thank you also to our president here, Collins. Thank you so much, uh, President Commissioner Collins, for his support. He called me before I could call him. And they called the race and said it was going to start. He called me and said, don't forget to let me back you up. You know how yes. valuable that yes. is? Yes. yes, that is so valuable. Um, and the so, same is true for Vice President Patterson. Thank you so much. And he has just willfully and gleefully done so. And I, I just don't take it, take it for granted. So I thank you also to our senator who has been my friend and partner for years now. Thank you so much as well, Senator Jackson, um, who has been really on the front lines with me in so many areas as our sheriff. He was a delegate, he was a senator, but he just really has been working so hard with all of us, and we thank him so much for that. I have the best team this side of heaven. I want to thank each of them um, as well. We have um, uh, with us Riley and Hannah. I want to thank Michael and David and Camille uh, for being here today also, and then so many others who have come out. This is such a, a powerful room. I know we have school board members who have come out. We have my sister from First Baptist Church of Glen Arden who reminded me not to miss the Christmas play tonight. She wants to stay, uh, stay prayed up and stay in this race in the right way. But I want to thank all of you uh, for taking time. The members of our Democratic Central Committee, I want to thank each of them for coming out. Some of them have come out more than once. I want to thank them also uh, for coming out. And for all of you taking time uh, during the holiday weekend when you could be finishing up your shopping, and instead, you've come out here to give us some time to talk about the U.S. Senate and to talk about the future of our county here, the future of our state, and the future of our country. Um, you recognize, like I do, we often talk about uh, the right to vote and the right to participate. And what we know is that we also, likewise, have an obligation 
to be engaged in all of these matters. It is so especially important. I often say about politics, the one thing that we understand about it is that whoever has the power decides where the resources go. And for all of us who care about our families and communities, it is especially important that we are present and accounted for when the decisions are made that affect the daily lives of the people that we love. Um, that is what I am excited about where Maryland is concerned because Maryland stands out across the country um, for us to know we are as a state, a state that really does stand out as a leader in terms of how progressive we are in our thinking and policies and the way that we have really in, on issues such as gun control and, and uh, smart gun policies and so many other ways we have really stood out um, among the country. So I've been really excited to have the chance to, um, to run and to represent Maryland, but it has also been my great pleasure. I'm a lifelong Marylander. I am also a lifelong Prince Georgian. Um, as you've heard uh, President Collins say, however, I am in the business of just loving people. And so when the reporters, he's right, when they came to me hoping to start some mess, and they said, oh, what do you think about the fact that they just announced that Charles County has more affluent African Americans than Prince George's? I said, that's perfect. Because isn't it our goal overall to make sure that all of us do well? Yeah. Every single one of us. I don't think they had the they were intending uh, when they asked that question, but I said that's perfect. That's exactly what we have been working for. We hope to create more prosperity for more of our families. That's what we're here for. Now, I, before I begin telling you about more about the Senate, I'd like to just also take a moment and talk to you about how my family came to be in Maryland in the first place. My family members are Southerners. Uh, came here, some from a place called Seneca, South Carolina. And they came here in 1956, following the murder of my great-grandfather by a sheriff's deputy. My great-grandfather's name was J.C. James, and he was epileptic and would often have seizures. He had a seizure one day, and he was accused of being drunk in public. Well, there was a white man who stood up for him who said he is not drunk, we know him very well, his name is J.C. James, and for that sheriff's deputy who felt contradicted in public, he was very embarrassed. And so he vowed he was gonna seek revenge. He said, I'm gonna come back and I'll get you. And that's what he did. On July 4th, 1956, he saw my great-grandfather walking. He stopped, took out a gun, he shot at his feet first, telling him to dance. He shot him in his abdomen and he died there on the side of the road. Now, our family went to the courthouse in Seneca a week later, and they were told that no crime had been committed. They were further told that if they didn't leave, they would kill the whole family. So a week after that time, my mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and several other family members traveled north, and they eventually settled in a place, a little town called Fairmont Heights, which is in <laughs> Prince George's County, Maryland. So they were brought here by a woman, and I often refer to these women who are doing all kinds of incredible things as super bad women. Well, Maybelle James was the person who brought our family here, and she was a super bad woman. She was my great-grandmother. She had been born in 1897, and she was whip smart. She was whip smart, and it was her husband who had been murdered. Now, Maybelle would convey the story to me and to many others in the family, and, and I, was, I was really privileged. I grew up with Maybelle and learn so much from her. She would keep articles in newspapers. She was really fascinated and, and, and terrified um, about the Ku Klux Klan, for example. So she had clipped all kinds of articles, so she was a historian of sorts. She was just a brilliant woman. But I grew up with her, and in fact, she lived until I was a first year law student. And, um, and so she taught me many things. Now, chief among the lessons she taught me, and the one that I think accounts for my presence here today, was that she firmly believed, and she would say this even as she conveyed the story about her husband's murder, that you don't have the right to complain and sit on the sidelines when you don't like things in your life. But she said, you know what, you have, if you don't like it, you should go farther and you should do better. And that's what I tried to do. I was raised by two incredible parents. Um, they were both very working class folks. My mom retired. Uh, she'd been a receptionist for most of her career, an administrative uh, aide um, for about 50 years. My father is the most brilliant, he is to this day, one of the most brilliant people I have ever met in my lifetime. Did not have the chance to go to college, uh, but he worked as a newspaper distributor for the Washington Post newspaper. And then he went on to work as a car salesman. And together, the two of them really did emphasize the power of a good education. In our family, it was very important, education. So uh, for me and for my sister. So I went to Duke University, 
graduated from Duke University, and then came home to the University of Maryland to law school. And I decided very early on that I was going to spend my life in public service. So I was lucky. In 1997, I was hired as the first full-time domestic violence prosecutor to ever work in the state's attorney's office in Prince George's County. And I immediately, I fell in love with that work, defending and protecting women and children and families, and continued throughout government. And then in 2010, I was inspired to run for state's attorney by my daughter. You know, I was saying to a friend, a childhood friend, she's growing up in a place I feel is less safe than the one I grew up in. And I was going on to say, I could ride my bike all over the neighborhood. My mom didn't have to see where I was, and it's not the same for her. Well, this friend cut me off and said, you know what? If you don't plan to change it, I don't think we should talk about it again. And this, I was so convicted by that. That's Maybell speaking, right? I said, you know what? I, you're absolutely right. I'm going to run for state's attorney. So I was elected in 2010. At the time, they said, this is a nice lady, but there is no way she will be able to do this thing. But you know what? The people came for me. They elected me, and I did exactly as I promised. During the two terms that I served as state's attorney in Prince George's County, we saw a 50% cut in violent crime. I also created the first of its kind unit to investigate official misconduct and police misconduct. And I created important units to do restorative justice programs. One was called I Belong Here, which worked against truancy to help incentivize attendance for middle school kids. I sent prosecutors into those schools each month. I also replicated the back on track program that Vice President Harris created. She helped me to do this for first time nonviolent drug offenders to get them in community college, to get them workforce development training, and to get them on the path to a middle class. Now, I tell you the things I tell you about prosecution was this. I sat in courtrooms for about 13 years, which means I learned during that time so much. I sat close to our family. And what I learned was what made us suffer. And what I saw were systemic issues that I felt could really be cured if we had just made the right investments in people. What happens when we have so many who have addictions that are untreated? What happens when we haven't invested in mental health care? What about when we don't have affordable or workforce housing? What about true economic opportunity for our families, economic justice for our kids who need opportunities to work in the summer, to know that they will have opportunities to have career and technical education and entrepreneurship? What happens when we don't have it? So I decided that rather than just reacting to the pain that I saw in that courthouse, I was gonna do something about that too and decided to run for county executive. I was elected in 2018, and with all of these folks together who've been working, we've gotten some things done. First of all, Prince George's County has the second oldest school facilities in the state of Maryland. Over 40% of our school buildings are 60 years old or old. And what that means is I have driven up on so many occasions, I've volunteered, I've gone inside these schools, and I've said to myself, what are we saying to our kids? who are learning in buildings that do not befit their dignity, that are falling down all around them. It says something about their potential. It says something about what we believe about them. And I decided to do something about that too. So I worked along with our school CEO, Dr. Monica Golson, and others, and we pushed the only one of, the, in its, of, of its kind in the state, public-private partnership, to build schools more quickly and at a cost savings. Uh, we put that structure in place. It's the only one here and one of the only ones across the country. And I'm really proud that over the last three years, we have used that structure. And our delegation had to go that hard in Annapolis to get this approved because it's the only one we had. But we used that structure in the last three years to break ground on 10 new schools in Prince George's County. We opened the doors to six of them this fall. We're using the structure next year. We've gotten approval. We're breaking ground on another eight schools. So during the course of my time as county executive, we opened six of the buildings already this fall. We will have broken ground on 18 new schools in a six year period for the benefit of our children. Now, I've also been very passionate about health care. I'm going to talk about this, how it relates to the Senate, but you all will agree with me on this point as well. We have so severely misdiagnosed what I know is a public health crisis and called it a crime crisis. And what do we mean by that? As prosecutor, I learned, would you all believe? that over 70% of the people we arrest on any given day and take to the local Department of Corrections are intoxicated when they get there. 70. Would you believe that a third of all the people we arrest every day and take to the local Departments of Correction are on psychotropic medications when they arrive? So what we've done as a country, as a state, and as counties is we arrest and recycle people in and out of our correctional, local correctional facilities who are sick with addiction and who are sick with mental illness, and we put them in places where they can't even be here. 
decided to do something about that too. So in 2020, as we looked out, we were building a public safety training facility. We still built it, but I decided to take $20 million out of that fund and put out of a capital fund, put it on the ballot to let the voters decide. And last year, we built the first of its kind and opened the doors to our first ever mental health and addictions care facility to ever <coughs> open its doors in our county so we can heal our loved ones. <laughs> has the highest rate of breast cancer, lung cancer, colorectal, and prostate cancer in the state. And the only major county in the state without a, a, a cancer center. So I worked alongside our delegation. They brought back for us $67 million, and we're opening the doors next year to our first ever cancer center so that our loved ones can be treated at home. Now, that's another issue, and the reason that I am so proud uh, Jeff Kendall and Sora Karen is because we understand one thing that Dr. King said to us. When his life ended, where was he? He was talking about economic justice and what that means. What does economic opportunity mean for all of us? It is the number one issue at the kitchen tables of people all across our state. They want to know how is it that we can afford the cost of living? What do? How do we have a true opportunity to, to really enjoy the American dream? This has been a priority for economic opportunity, jobs, and income, and making sure that our families are able to thrive, which is why I was so proud to work along with our delegation, the federal delegation, and to work with others, and to have announced recently that we are bringing the national headquarters for the FBI to Maryland. Now, you will notice that right after that announcement, bless them, the Virginians fell on the ground. They screamed, they hollered, someone pulled their pants down and screamed, uh, foul. And you know what? They understand what we understand about how these federal assets, using your taxpayer dollars, by the way, these job centers, how they change forever the economy of the area that they come to. These are transformational opportunities, once in a generation opportunities. Don't think for a minute, the Pentagon was a policy decision. The location of the Pentagon on the western part of the Potomac in 1941 to be located in Northern Virginia was a policy decision. That, and look at what it has done for Northern Virginia. It has created in Fairfax County the wealthiest, second wealthiest community in the United States of America. So these assets and these, these, these um, investments that we bring back do mean so much to our communities. And this is what I have done as county executive is to bat hard every day to bring every single one of those opportunities, including, for example, if you look at New Carrollton Metro, we've been working a lot around transit. If you all, I don't know how many of you have been to New Carrollton recently, but you'll see it is changing before your very eyes. We've been able to attract close to, in, in my administration, 100 million new dollars in just the last two years to invest in front of the, the New Carrollton Metro uh, to make sure that it is now the premier transit hub on the Eastern Seaboard. All of the traffic that's coming through Union Station, Union Station's closing for two years renovation. Do you know that when that happens, all of that traffic is now coming through um, through New Carrollton? Our very own right here in Maryland, that particular hub now is going to create 25,000 jobs. It also has workforce housing. These are the kinds of opportunities that I will continue to work on as a senator. I tell you the things that I have told you um, to tell you something very important about the Senate of the United States. I believe that it is so important for you to have senators who not only work hard for you every single day, but ones who know you, understand you, and share the cares and concerns of everyday hard working people. It is the case, if you look at the Senate, that there are too few there right now who live like or think anything like the people they represent. And it is important, it's hard to represent people you don't know or understand. I understand you, I know you, because the cares and concerns that are at your kitchen table are at mine too. This is important. It has been important not only from a professional standpoint as a person who has, over the years, as an executive, it's been my job to create policies that make your lives better every single day. And also, it has been my job to make daily decisions. All of these executives and, and, and leaders, legislators who had along with us during COVID, we had to make decisions every single day that immediately impacted your life. I've been able to do that, but I have to also tell you that my lived experience, our lived experiences do matter. They do matter. As a mother, as a mother, to, to have a teenage daughter who is a, a freshman in college right now has been really important to understand the things that, that, that our youth confront. 
the challenges that, that, that are in their lives every day. Any parent who had a child home during COVID-19, for example, my daughter was a freshman in high school, came to understand not just through our kids, but through their friends, what anxiety and depression looked like. Yeah. What happened when they were isolated and the ways that they struggled. We have to know that in order to help represent that generation, you've got to understand what they are dealing with. I'm also, like many of you in this room probably, how many in here are in the sandwich generation? But well, we are caring for our kids and also supporting our amazing parents. My parents were aging. I have a mother who was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's last year. Um, she's still, she's an incredible person, but it has brought to bear for our family what it really means to be able to afford the out-of-pocket cost of prescription drug medications. What it really means to have access to insurance for all of us and to know that that universal, that health is the, Health care is the right of every person to have quality, affordable health care here in Charles County and in the southern part of the county. This is a huge issue. Health care access. It's a huge issue. How do we have to make sure we have the primary care physicians that we need? How are we building out a pipeline of professionals who can care for us, the specialists? How do we have access to that health care we need? These are the issues that we've had. Thank you all so much. And, and so many of the other issues. So as a U.S. Senator, I will continue to fight to make sure that health care access is important and that we'll bring back the resources we need to not only continue to fund Medicaid and Medicare, but making sure that we're fighting to, to really cap the out-of-pocket cost of prescription drug medications and that we are creating a public option so that all of us have access to health care. I'll continue fighting as a U.S. Senator to make sure also as we talk about education, we have made a huge mistake. And part of the mistake is that we have allowed local jurisdictions, your tax dollars, uh, to control, really to fund primarily education, local education, which has meant that very generally, your zip code determines the quality of education that you get, and there's something so wrong with that. And so we've got to increase funding, increase federal funding for education so we don't see these disparities grow. Doing things like increasing funding, for example, for Title I so that our kids who are in disadvantaged and impoverished areas have the opportunity to have a quality education and making sure we are also bringing down the cost of college. That what we're passing on to our kids is a burden. It's a horrible burden. The cost of college is absolutely unbelievable. It's astronomical. We can do things like increase funding for Pell Grants and make sure that as the president has done, that we forgive a portion of college indebtedness so that our kids are free to serve our communities. We also have to create a pathway for our kids who are not interested in college. We have brilliant kids. They come here brilliant. And so career and technical education and entrepreneurship is going to be really important uh, for all of our kids to be able to access. And then finally, I want to talk to you also about freedom. You know, our freedom is what makes us American. It's, it's what defines our way of life. And right now, we're watching this craziness happen where all of these rights that our foreparents have fought for are being rolled back one after the next. We're looking, for example, um, as we see voting rights, you know, I was so glad to see that jury decide yesterday a $148 million verdict against Rudy Giuliani, who tried to prevent those workers in Georgia, um, who were elections workers, who defamed them, and tried to ruin their lives and, and hurt them and cause them harm. A $148 million verdict. But I'll be there fighting for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act yes. to ensure that we are not seeing this kind of rollback of rights we have. Say a couple of other ones. A woman's right to choose, a woman in Texas, whose doctor decided that she needed critical health care. She had to leave the state to get the health care she needed. You know, this is this is disgraceful. I was two when Roe versus Wade was decided. Here we are 50 years later, and my daughter has to fight the same fight that really should have been won by her grandmother. How disgraceful is this? So I'll be also, as a senator, signing up for the Women's Health Protection Act to once and for all codify federally the right to, to access abortion care and to make sure that women get to the opportunity to make their own decisions about their health care and about their bodies. Fighting for LGBTQ rights. We just keep seeing one after the next, the rights are rolling back. And I know also there are some veterans in the house. I've been fighting hard for veterans. You know, as a, as a, as a, a county executive, I created the first of its kind um, Office of Veterans Affairs in, in Prince George's to make sure that our veterans, when we needed them, we sent them into service. And when they need us, they should not have to be looking for us. Mm -hmm. The, the resources that they need ought to be available to them. So, you know, I, I'll just say this in the end. This race is an important race. And don't let anybody tell you any different. One of 100 is a very powerful place to be. And as I've said before, person, what we know about elected officials and know about politics. 
is whoever has the power decides where the resources go. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. And we ought to have people <coughs> in position who understand all of us and who believe that we each should have the right to have. I'm going to say a couple of things about my, uh, the race. I mean, my opponent is a billionaire. In fact, he's the wealthiest person to serve in Congress. Um, and he has said he's going to spend $50 million of his own money on this race. In fact, he said he's going to spend whatever it takes. And so that's what you see. Up on the airways, the commercials, flooding the mailboxes. I honestly don't think democracy ought to work that way that the wealthiest among us are the ones who should be able to buy your way into office. I honestly do think that. Um, that that's not the way that this was intended to be. Um, so there is a difference there. I thank you all for your help, because I forgot. I should have just started out by, uh, by uh, disclosing. I'm not a billionaire. Uh, for anybody who was wondering, y'all are looking shy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it is, it, is, it is an important race for it to have people there who, who live like us and think like, and think like the people they represent. Um, and I can say to you, I've seen some commercials on the air, and I'm just going to be blunt and come right out with it and tell you what I've seen. I have been so distressed by the commercials that I've seen. And many of you have probably seen these commercials and advertising a second chance. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's primarily what it is, primarily an African-American men on the commercial saying that these are people who needed the second chance, and these are the person who get the second chance, and, you know, all of these basically poor um, black and brown people in these commercials. Now, the thing that's disturbed me about it is I believe in second chances. I have worked hard in the system to make sure we've created an, an office for returning citizens and we believe in second chances. And more importantly, this, the distinction between me and my opponent is I believe you deserve the first chance. Yes. Not to be picked up off the ground after you have not been invested. You deserve the first chance for all of our kids to be educated, to receive a sound education, to have affordable and workforce housing to make sure all of us can afford to live in safe places, that you should have access to health care that you should have true economic opportunity, have the opportunity to grow businesses like this business is, to have access to wealth. That's what I believe about all of our communities, is that it is not just that you deserve the second chance, you deserve the first chance in this country for each of us to equally enjoy the American dream. So that is a, a one of the differences, and again, I thank you for coming out. And look, now this race is going to take Lottie Dottie and everybody to get us across the finish line. None of us can afford to stay home. And I have learned, like all of you, nothing happens if we don't show up. No, and nobody's going to give us anything, which is why we're out seven days a week talking to people. But I do need your help to talk to your neighbors and friends and your colleagues and others, to take a yard sign and put it in the yard and send a message out. I'm so glad I have some of the young ones here who know how to do social media much better than I do. Because then you can share this information along with the, to your friends and tell them about the race and get all of us involved. But let me stop and answer questions um, because I know. I was asked to referee the Q&A. Okay. <laughs> and so. Mm -hmm. The um, county executive mentioned that Prince George's County was the first county to do, and only county to do the P3. Uh, partnership on, on refurbishing and building schools. Um, we on the 27th team, as well as our friends in Charles County, would like to say that Charles County was the second. To get to get her legislative body and others to work on that. And we fought our colleagues, trust me. We fought our colleagues because they did not want to see that. We sort of uh, outmaneuvered them on that to get it first, and they fought us tooth and nail. Uh, but the power is in the numbers. Prince George's has 31 uh, representatives in, in the uh, General Assembly, along with our Charles County colleagues and some others. Uh, we uh, got folks together to make sure that that piece of legislation passed. And again, Charles County was the second, and we're, we're, getting, we're glad to be a part of that. So. The executive walked in the room, she made it clear she wanted to speak directly to you, the residents. So we have time for about three questions, maybe. So, but this is an opportunity. This is why she's here. She wants to hear from you directly. Did anyone want to start it off? Donnie Michael. You can tell. Okay. That is like hype out. So, uh, first, thank you for being here. Um, I'm a proud military, a war veteran. And this is sort of veteran related, but military or federal related. So, based on Charles County's uh, wealth, and in my opinion, we have probably one of the lowest federal agencies, military bases, federal contractors 
uh, in, in the state of Maryland. Uh, how will you assist Charles County to be more representative, like such counties as Prince George's, Harford, and Arundel, when it comes to, and, and let's face it, federal agencies or military brings in economic development. I've lived in those counties, I know what it does, but I just don't see it here. And based on the amount of wealth that we have, it's trust. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, the question is about what will I do to, to make sure that we see resources for veterans um, coming to the Charles County area and, um, and other resources, honestly. I mean, I, I think, so I, I believe that um, the equitable distribution of those federal assets is very important. That's what I was talking about when I talked about the FBI. And you're right, Charles County, in my opinion, has not gotten its fair share. I mean, I can just look right out and tell you, I, I know, so Prince George's has the highest concentration of veterans, but many of them are moving um, also into Charles County. So if there will be a need for things like the CBOC, those county-based uh, county health care centers for veterans. Um, that's one of the things that I fought for uh, for Prince George's County and worked alongside Senator Van Hollen um, to get, and I'll be working to make sure that we get additional um, resources in that area coming into Charles County as well. It is something that I have already seen. And like I said, there are many other um, needs that Charles County has. Um, the transit here, we have a need for uh, additional uh, resources here. I know that you all have had a concern uh, that we have supported trying to, to make sure that we got more dollars and investments here to grow transit. We are in a terrible time. You've heard about some of the um, the revenue right, right now that we're seeing, but that means that we're going to have to rely also on federal dollars. It can't just be state dollars. We're going to have to leverage county, state, and federal dollars to be able to address some of the needs. But veterans, I promise you, uh, will not be left off the list of things that I am there to do and to focus on. Um, I've done it as county executive, and I'll keep doing it as a U.S. Senator. Thank you. Further questions? Okay. Thank you. Madam County Executive, how can folks help your campaign? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how can folks help your campaign? And thank you so much for that. We have a clipboard here. There are so many ways you can help. Somebody here may feel, for example, you can host a meet and greet with 10 or 15 of your friends um, similar to this. Just allow me to come in and meet the people you know in your living room or someplace else. Or you may be a part of an organization that you may want to invite me out, like the Kappa. <laughs> They're out, out in the room. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and other organizations. I know I met the president of NAACP is here. So, you know, if there are organizations that you can invite me so I can meet people, that's great. Take a yard sign. We, we're going to need door knockers, people making phone calls. Come election day, I need people who are going to stand at the polls and hand out literature. Um, people who can raise money. You know, we, we, we I'm in a race where so far my opponent has spent more than the entire gubernatorial field combined in the last election. He's already spent more than, they, so for example, the governor bought like 1,900 points of television in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. My opponent has already bought and spent 11,000 points. He's already spent at this point. 35,000. 35,000, I'm sorry. 35,000, so, yeah. so we just have to, but that doesn't, we're not worried about that because it's the people who are gonna decide to raise it. We, and we have support all over the state. And we're raising money. Great, great. So, but all the help you can give will be. Good. And my question is, you know, the other guy, I'm say it today, that he's always sending things in the mail. I throw it right in the trash. But two at a time. I was wondering, will you be sending anything at all? Anymore? We will be sending mail. We're going to be going up on air. We have had to take a very dis disciplined approach. We have raised, by the end of this year, more money um, than any statewide candidate in this race. So we are this. We have had historic numbers. The first quarter of this race, we raised 1.7 million dollars in just the opening seven weeks of the race. So we are raising money. But we had to be disciplined about when we go up. We want to stay up, and we want to continue to be able to mail. We didn't want to go up prematurely before we had raised the money. But your contributions do matter. Ten, whatever you can contribute, really will help us. And so anyone here who has the ability to contribute to this campaign, please do, um, because it does matter, and it means that we get to send the mailers. It means that we get to get up on television. Uh, it means that we get to fuel our campaign. Okay. I have a question. So I am a reside 17 year Prince George's County Public School educator. And I was CTE, uh, Career and Technology Pathway. And so the national platform as well as the state push is to expand CTE for our youth. 
So I was forced out of the public school and I own two beauty schools. Maryland is a bond protected state. I, w I live in Charles County. I work in Prince George's County for my business. I would love to expand. However, the bond protection for the state of Maryland doesn't allow small businesses, especially women of color, to be able to do the expansion, which would support um, your goal of assisting with career technology education. What is your stance on supporting small business, private career schools with their platform to be able to expand and provide those uh, services so needed that the young people don't have the intellect to make those decisions at the high school level and can't afford to um, go to school out of pocket. So I do think there have to be multiple pathways mm -hmm. to middle class. And so what you're describing, a business that trains people, for example, to go into cosmetology, um, to go into other, other areas, I totally support this. Uh, we've supported some of it, again, through our Career and Technical Education Entrepreneurship Hub, which I just funded last year, uh, funded at an additional $15 million that we were able to do. And we're going to continue to find opportunities to support businesses um, and to support apprenticeships and other things that help our kids um, to have the skills they need to not only work in these areas, but to be like you, to be an entrepreneur, to own a business. And so I do support that. Of course. Yes. This is Al Waldorf Live. I need to get, uh, understand your take on Charles County going into become considering, at least considering the charter. And what will be your take on that? Well, I know that Charles County is going to have that on the ballot in 2024. I think that's for Charles County to decide. Um, so I think I'm going to mind my business where that's concerned. And let Charles County make its own decision. See, see how brilliant this one is. <laughs> but that's really going to close the question. The county executive, she is going to spend a few minutes uh, walk, walking around the room. Uh, thank you, everyone, thank you so for coming everyone. out. This was an outstanding event. But we have to be mindful that we have to establish a strong presence here in Charles County. And so if you can, sign up to be a part of the team. Because we want to make a clear distinction here in Charles County. This is Angela Austin Brooks' country right now.